Hello again. Um, so today uh, we're going to be talking about Aristotle and happiness, or Aristotelian happiness, mostly coming from the Nicomachean ethics. Uh, it's called this because he had a son named Nicomachus, and in a lot of ways this book is in some senses about child rearing or how we ought to have the good life or become the great souled man or to achieve the human telos or goal, purpose, final cause, end, etc. If you watched my earlier video, we talked about this some, but when we ask the question of what something is, Aristotle says that there are four answers, right? There's a formal cause, and the formal cause is what? Well, that's what makes the thing the thing that it is and not something else. Then there's the material cause, what it's composed of, you know? Um, so what makes the thing the thing it is and not something else for a human being? You know, skin, eyes, teeth, organs, etc. for a chair, legs, a seat, a back. I mean, humans have a much longer list. Material, we've got, you know, for the chair, seat, uh, we've got like wood, metal, plastic, something like that. Um, you know, whatever it's actually composed of for human beings, like blood and keratin in your nails and hair and um, other types of cells and things like that. And then we have the efficient cause or what brings the thing into being. It's craftsmen or whatever you want to call it. Um, and then finally, uh, or it's proximate mover, as we um, would like to call it, right? The not approximate as in sort of close to, but proximate as in exactly. And then we have the final cause or the telos, which is why we call this whole thing teleology. What is the purpose, the aim, the goal, the completion, the full fruition, or my personal favorite and probably best Greek translation, your flourishing. So the flourishing of a chair is to be sat in. The flourishing of a human being, according to Aristotle, is eudaimonia or happiness. So the word happiness, uh, as I have said before, is not a particularly great translation of the word eudaimonia, because you meaning well or good or great, and daimon meaning spirit or soul means the great souled man, literally. Um, but it also means to lead the good life or, or to have the good life. Um, and what that entails, we talked about some last time. It's also this, our telos or our, our, our flourishing or our end goal or aim. When I ask you why you do a thing, you give me lots of answers, but eventually the answer ends up with, at the end, it's telos, which is happiness. We do everything for the sake of happiness and happiness is for the sake of nothing else. It is the for the sake of which that all the for the sake of which is are for. Um, we have some other things like virtue, he claims, that are also done for their own sake, but virtue also contributes to happiness. So virtue is superior to happiness since you cannot have happiness without virtue. We'll explain that today. Um, <clears throat> all right, so uh, according to Aristotle in the readings and as well as in the Nicomachean Ethics, happiness or eudaimonia here, again, this is not happy today, sad tomorrow, or joy, or something along those lines. This is, this is a very different sort of concept. Is an activity of the soul in accord with virtue. That is the most important part of this. It's the part that you actually have the most influence over and have the most effect on. Um, without virtue, you can't do this. Now, Again, virtue here is important, and virtue is about pleasures and pains, but it's about feeling pleasure and pain at the right sort of thing. When you do a good thing, you should feel good. When you do a bad thing or a vicious action, you should feel bad. And that's why virtue, in a nutshell, in the most simple terms that we can come up with, is going to lead to the good life or the happy life. Vicious people aren't generally very happy, even if they get small joys out of life from, you know, screwing people over or doing horrible things and feeling good momentarily, their life does not generally turn out as though it were a good one at the end, or they're miserable a lot of it, but they get small joys every once in a while, but that does not make it the great souled man, that does not make it the telos of mankind that we work and struggle and strive and suffer for our whole lives. It's not about vicious actions or momentary pleasures. The good life is not built on these, so saith Aristotle, anyways. So it's an activity of the soul. Now we talked about the soul last time, and remember when we talk about the soul, it's not some sort of free-floating spirit. What it is instead is 
the the animus that which animates us right and it's comprised of the rational part the logos right or it, not or and the irrational part and the irrational part is broken down into three parts the vegetative or nutritive which is like just your basal or basal metabolic functions like breathing digestion growth of nails and hair and all such things um that you have no control over but it keeps you alive right i mean you can control your breathing some but you don't have to think about it um your heart beating it's not up to you um again you can do some stuff to kind of mess with it but in a general sense vegetative stuff not important what is important is the spirited part of the soul um and the appetitive part of the soul. Uh, so the spirited or thumus in the ancient Greek is that which moves you through a certain sort of passion like anger or jealousy or rage or um, <clears throat> maybe even compassion possibly. Um, again, it's that welling up within oneself that we feel when we have team spirit or esprit de corps in the military or something like that, uh, or that sort of momentary instance of wanting to move to action when some when a child is in danger or your significant other is being threatened or uh, yourself, something like that. Um, the fight or flight thing that comes over you if you want to get biological about it. Um, <clears throat> which Aristotle is sort of doing a biology here of sorts. Uh, and then, of course, the epithumus or the um, appetitive part of the soul, the appetites, the desires in a certain sense that we have, also motivate us or conduce us towards things to do, like eating food, drinking water, like this, because I'm thirsty, wanting sex or drugs and rock and roll, as I said last time, you know, these sorts of things uh, are all things that our appetites uh, move us towards. Also, Aristotle says that we have appetites for things that are good, like health and happiness and um, knowledge, right? That, that's a good appetite to have and to feed and satiate. Although with all of these things, um, there are excesses and deficiencies, which is going to come up when we talk about virtue at some greater length, which we will do in just a minute or so. Well, more than a minute likely, but it's an activity of the soul in accord with virtue. That is the most basic component of what leads to the good life or happiness. He also says that vicious people aren't very happy because they think of the vicious things that they've done and the vicious things that they will do because they know themselves to be vicious. And on top of that, they have a lot of pain and regret. And those things they claim are not good. You don't want that. I mean, you know, I'm a grinder personally, so I think about all of the things that I do every day at night. It's what keeps me up at night. Did I do this lecture right? Did I do enough work today? Have I done enough of my chores around the house? Um, you know, did I uh, do this, that, or the other just the way I wanted to? Should I re-record this lecture or not? You know, should I have said something better or worse? Or did I say something horrible? You know, those sorts of things grind my gears a lot. So, um, you know, virtue is good because if you do the virtuous action, or at least work towards it, you know that you're bettering yourself and you're making your life a good one. All right, so it's um, an activity of the soul in accord with virtue completed over a lifetime. So he says that one drink does not make, sorry, not one drink, one swallow does not make a spring. I used to think that he meant a swallow of water uh, doesn't make us a, uh, a spring of water. But um, after having translated the ancient Greek, apparently he actually meant a swallow as in the bird, because apparently in uh, Peloponnesia or ancient Greece or whatever, um, at, during springtime, there's a whole flight of swallows that come through or something like that. So if you see one swallow, then, you know, that's not a big deal. But if you see a bunch of them, then apparently spring is coming. Uh, it's a saying, I don't know. I actually like my earlier version better, but whatever. It's not one moment of happiness. It's also not one moment of sorrow. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a consistent activity over time. It's also not a state. You're not, you don't get to it. And then there I am, I have achieved my state of happiness. You know, uh, I have reached self-actualization. No, this is constant and continuous and it doesn't end until death. And even then he claims it might be the case that your happiness could be ruined by your reputation after death. But I don't think we're really worried about that. And he says, don't worry about that anyways. But he does bring up salons, um, uh, great saying. Uh, Salon was the famed author of the Athenian Constitution, and he had many sage-like sayings, and he was famed for saying, count no man happy until he is dead, 
which most people feel is a curmudgeon sort of, you know, um, dismal and, uh, you know, in a certain sense, really like, I don't know, grumpy old man sort of way of saying it's better to be dead than alive. But Aristotle takes that and critically examines it. And if you're actually reading real Aristotle right now, um, some of you are, some of you aren't. Um, if you want, Gutenberg Project has it, although it's, or Project Gutenberg, it, it's not a great translation because it's really old, like early uh, 1900s, but whatever. At any rate, so um, he, Aristotle genuinely almost always goes with the average everyday word on the street, and then he analyzes it critically and engages it, and then he uses logic to ferret out whether or not we should accept or deny the you know truth of said statement, like that one that I just said, or that virtue makes you happy, or any of those sorts of things. And then based on logic, usually, he says that this is the case or this isn't the case. Sometimes by direct fiat, he's just like, no, that's just ridiculous. Um, odd thing to say, uh, ridiculous, ta uh, gelion in the ancient Greek means not just ridiculous, but also absurd um, or laughable. Um, this is important because those are not exactly the same things, though when we translate the word for laughter or laughing, it's always gelion, um, but uh, usually when they translate it in Aristotle and Plato, they utilize it as um, uh, absurd. So when they claim something's absurd, they sort of mean that it's laughable. Um, interesting sort of thing. We'll, we might touch on that later. Uh, at any rate, so it's completed over a lifetime. So you, you gotta have to have this mostly consistently throughout one's life. You gotta be virtuous and it's gotta have at least minimal external goods with at least one complete friend. Okay, so what does that mean? External goods are goods that are not internal like virtue. Virtue is internal. There's no substance to it that physically we can touch, taste, smell, or see, or any of that stuff. But external um, goods are things that also other internal goods are like knowledge and things like that. It's like I can't like, uh, so for instance, I owe a whole lot of money um, to the government for my uh, student loans. But on the plus side, unlike an external good, say like a car or a house, they can't ever repossess that from me because uh, thus far they aren't able to repossess my brain. So uh, my knowledge gets to be there regardless of whether or not not, um, I pay up for that ever over my lifetime, <laughs> which it will probably likely be completed over a lifetime. At any rate, so you need at least minimal external goods. He says that if you're born a slave or without any money or that you're starving and on the street, you are not going to be able to achieve human flourishing. You are not going to be able to be the great souled man, have the good life or achieve your telos as a human, which is eudaimonia or happiness. You're not going to be that way if you don't have at least a roof over your head, food in your mouth, and somebody who doesn't own you, literally, um, who can beat, rape, and kill you as they choose or please. Um, so again, or th this is very important. You have to have at least minimal external good. Those also include, oddly enough, your physicality because if you're extremely infirmed or deformed, as he says later, um, that's also going to ruin your happiness. Um, and with the at least one complete friend, we're not talking about, you know, your acquaintances or who you claim are your friends on Facebook. What we mean by friend in this instance is like a significant other or someone that you would share everything with or promote their ends like you would promote your own. So for instance, helps put somebody through college or um, share a bank account with, because the old saying in the ancient Greek is what friends have is shared or held in common. Zunos is the ancient Greek for it. And um, that's, I mean, sure, you share with your friends, but the question is how much would you pay for their rent for a month? I mean, I have a couple of friends I would do that, no questions. Well, I mean, they'd probably have some questions asked, but I mean, still, I'd do that, and I wouldn't expect the money back. Also, I, Aristotle, much like myself, does not recommend loaning money to friends. He says you can give it to them, but loaning it's a bad idea because then your friends become scarce, he says. Um, also, if there's no agreement made beforehand, he claims um, money or gifts given to friends should be considered gone. You're just given, not not going to be returned or that that favor need be returned because that's not how complete friendship works. There are two other types of friendship, uh, friendships of utility, like, you know, you all probably have a friend who has a truck and they help you move stuff sometimes and you pay them in beer or pizza or something like that. And if you have a truck, you probably have more friends when somebody wants to move something, right? Okay. Or maybe a work friend, friend who will cover a shit for you you don't hang out. 
or even somebody maybe you hang out with, but you're not really friends. They're just a good drinking buddy, or they play video games with you, or card games with you, or dice, as Aristotle might. Uh, says or uh, you know uh, somebody that you find witty or funny or somebody that you find attractive or somebody that you might consider friends with benefits uh, a sexual partner that you are not interested in other than for the pleasure that they give you and that's the friendship of pleasure not the friendship of utility which is for use of some sort pleasure is for their pleasantness and then complete is both pleasant and useful but also you like them for their own sake wish them to be alive because can't wish them that if they want them to be the real friend. And uh, all friendship is 100% based on a, a sort of mutual well-wishing for each other. Each person must wish well for the other for them to actually be friends. Otherwise, that frenemy crap doesn't fly with Aristotle. You can't hate somebody and still pretend to be their friend and actually be their friend. And you also have to love the person or be friends with the person for the sake of who they actually are, not who they pretend to be. Um, <clears throat> notably, the word for friend in ancient Greece can be either philos or eros, which means either philos is like in philosophy, lover of or friend of, sophia, wisdom, uh, and eros is lover of or friend of, you know, whatever, but eros is generally speaking erotic in nature or sexual in nature, though it doesn't need to be. It just usually is intense and short-lived, whereas philos is generally enduring and not nearly as intense, so like normal BFF or friends or family or something like that. At any rate, you need at least one complete friend because he says, will we come, anyone's life is happy, truly happy, if they didn't have at least one good friend? I mean, think to yourself. You might not even have one right now. That's fine. But I wouldn't consider it the best life. I wouldn't consider it the good life. Um, you know, the, the, the telos uh, of all mankind, if you didn't have at least one friend. I mean, even when people are isolated, like, in that movie, Cast Away with Tom Hanks, he makes up a friend, you know, with Wilson the ball, or um, if you watch Umbrella Academy, um, you know, uh, Five has uh, a mannequin girlfriend that he runs around with in, uh, in the future or whatever. But at any rate, we wouldn't want to count um, an imaginary friend, which would probably be, let's say, an internal good <laughs> uh, as an external good. And in general, that's, that's, we're not going to count that. What we need is a real human being who can be a good friend. And he says you can only have one to three of those because of time constraints. And um, because you, you can't just spend, the, you have to spend a lot of time with friends. Uh, you can't just see them every once in a while and call them friends. Then they're just acquaintances or just pass favors back and forth, swapping shifts or, you know, using the truck and buying beer or, you know, hanging out just to shoot pool or drink or, you know, whatever. Um, no, it's got to be something where you are close together. He actually says you live in the same domicile or place or um, you live near each other. And he says the distance has killed many friends and lack of conversation even more. So, you know, what you do together with your friends is what makes them your friends. And again, the complete kind is the kind that you do a lot of stuff with. And you, he says, share salt often in the book, which means you're able to bring out the salt for them at the table and eat meals with them because that's what you do with friends. Whenever your friends come in from out of town, if you've been away for a while, you usually share a meal. Maybe coffee if you're not that good a friend. Um, and sharing salt means that you brought out a very expensive commodity because in the ancient Greek world, salt was super expensive and very rare, and you didn't bring that out to the table unless it was co good company. It's like you don't bring out the good shit unless it's good company or somebody that's really your friend. It's like you don't break out the good scotch for just anyone or the nice Cuban cigars or um, the best coffee or whatever fancy thing that you have that you wouldn't share with just anyone. Um, but at any rate, a good bottle of wine or champagne or something like that. Um, still, uh, friendship is a, a matter of great importance. Aristotle spends two entire books in the Nicomachean Ethics just on friendship. And um, he says, if you're lucky, you get three friends, one of which will probably be, if you're lucky, one of your kids. Maybe not all of your kids, probably only one of your kids. It's going to be in touch with you every day and around you all the time. Um, your wife or husband and for obvious reasons. Um, in fact, most of the stuff in the book on friendship really very well applies to having a good significant other, a good relationship with your significant other that is greater than just having a sex slave and domestic, um, you know, par uh, sorry, uh, domestic servant. So like, I mean, for the majority of human history, basically marriage for the woman has been a matter of being sold off to another man for family 
ties and wealth, and then for them to produce offspring and then cook and clean. So it's a, a form of domestic slavery and uh, you know biological servitude uh, that you necessarily were you know kind of almost literally sold into. I mean, they used to produce dowries for women um, back in the day, I and mean, even up until the 20th century, they had hope chests, right? So that's money that you paid to the um, uh, male who was taking the female off the hands of the family or whatever or something like that. Fortunately, we don't have that going on so much anymore. Um, but at any rate, um, just carrying on, if you're lucky, your significant other will be somebody better than just that. Um, and hopefully you will choose your significant other for somebody better than just that as well, because you want to be friends with your significant other, because Otherwise, you're going to have a bad time and probably get divorced, especially in our current era, etc. All right, carrying on because everyone's like, oh my, you're giving this other my best friend. It's like, really? I mean, if mine is, I've been with my fiance for 17 years now as of the 5th of September. So, um, you know, we've been together a very long time and, uh, you know, I love her and she's my best friend. Um, but at any rate, and then maybe your BFF, you know, the person that is actually your best friend. I don't know, me, that's I like, have levels of friendship. I'll do this favor for you, that favor for you, I'll hang out this much, or I'll drive to Mexico to bail you out of jail. It's like top tier friendship kind of stuff, you know. Um, I might pay for a month of your rent or something like that, but if you really need it, you know, that kind of friendship is, is the, the, the top tier stuff, okay. So at any rate, friendship, very important. If you don't have somebody like that, it's gonna be difficult. And remember, you can't have too many of those because it's very difficult to spend that kind of time with them. We were seeing that show, Sister Wives. He, the guy who's um, has multiple wives, it's a reality TV show, I think on TLC or something like that. Um, he's uh, a polygamist um, Mormon, not the regular kind, but the kind that believe in multiple marriage. I don't really care if one of them to be consensual, but that guy doesn't look very happy because he has to schedule time with his five wives and it's like 20 some odd children and can't really distribute proper time between all of them because it's just impossible given the number of, uh, of kids and the, um, you know, just the sheer uh, time constraints that you have for that to go on. There's only two halves to the best friend necklace, right? You either get beef fry or stent. You don't get both. And there's not, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to have more than one truly best friend. I mean, there are exceptions, but it is very unusual. Um, also, and this is the last thing I'm going to say on friendship, he says that it's difficult well, actually, it's the second last thing. It's difficult to have uh, two friends, one who just won the lottery, got a promotion, was doing great, and then one whose mom just died, they just lost their job, and their dog got run over by a car. Now, how am I supposed to feel? Because you're supposed to genuinely feel happy for the person that had happy things go on, so genuinely meaning through and through you are sincerely happy, and then through and through you are sincerely sad for the other person. So what are you supposed to do in that state that you are supposed to be both sincerely happy and sincerely sad. It makes it very difficult to do both. Um, and you would be very conflicted as a result or just be sincerely happy in one situation and not in the other, making yourself flip flop like that so that you're not really consistent. Um, it seems kind of odd. Um, and then, cause like, you know, if there's somebody who you really love or somebody who's really your friend and something horrible has happened or something great has happened, it's really hard to spoil that mood or make that mood, make your, your, make yourself feel happy or good because it'll be weighing on your mind the bad stuff that has happened to or befallen your friend or the really good stuff that just happened to your other friend even though you, you kind of want to feel sad for somebody else or you kind of want to feel happy because somebody else had good news but you just feel crappy because of the weight of the friendship that you have with the other person and the last thing i'm going to say about friendship before we carry on is this that your friends are trying to make you happy that's the whole point friends are not useful or pleasant they're not making you happy so you don't need them you should cut them off according to aristotle um there's no point in having them. It, it's 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 not going to lead to your human telos your good life your great old man your eudaimonia is not bettered by people that are not making you happy in some way if they're not pleasant or useful then i don't understand the reason for you being friends with um, he says, sure, you might have been friends when you were kids or a long time, or blah, blah, blah. He says you should accord them some courtesy, but you shouldn't consider them friends if they're not at least pleasant or useful. And the complete friend is a totally different category, so much so he says that you wouldn't even necessarily call the other two categories really friends. Again, like I said, more like acquaintances or something like that. But 
your friendship is to try and make you happy. At the end of everything for Aristotle, it's always about being happy for human conduct or whatever. So what is it that your friend's going to do for you the best or the most that's going to make you happiest? They're gonna help you with virtue. So your friend has to be similar in virtue to you enough that you would listen to their advice. If they're too much virtue, too much more virtuous than you, you probably won't listen to them and you can't be really good friends. If they're too below you in your virtue, then you probably can't be good friends either because they're just not gonna give you good advice that you wanna listen to and you just won't wanna hang out with them. They have to be a complete friend is only between good people because Aristotle says vicious people can't make good friends. Similar in virtue. Um, uh, and that's really what's important. They're good people that are similar in virtue and they're trying to help each other be happy and that requires you to act in accord with virtue. So you help them make better decisions instead of making bad ones. If you ever watch a YouTube video where somebody's filming somebody else and they're like, yeah, go up there and slap the tiger on the ass. That person is not your friend. The person who's your friend is the one who's like, no, no, don't do that. That's stupid. No, don't get in the shopping cart on the rooftop. No, don't skateboard down the giant hill. That's your friend. The, friend. the person who's filming you is not your friend, okay? So at any rate, I'm just telling you, uh, it's someone who's going to help you promote your own virtue. Complete it over a lifetime, at least mineral eternal goods, at least one complete friend, and with no great calamities or great deformities. He says that if you have a great calamity, like everyone in your family dies, uh, your whole city is come to ruin and burn to the ground, um, you were raped, uh, molested as a child, you go totally bankrupt and are homeless and on the street. Um, you know, these sorts of calamities can ruin your happiness. Or great deformities, if you get into a car wreck or are born deformed or, you know, uh, something or you're afflicted with a horrible disease or something like that. He says that these sorts of great deformities can make it so that you cannot be happy within your society. Now, you can disagree with that. Now, we're not talking about when we say great deformities, like my queer eye that I have going on over here. That's fine, whatever, or a club foot or something like that, or a cleft palate or whatever. But what is going on is um, a great deformity, he says, makes it impossible for you to achieve a flourishing in one society. So if you even think back to that movie 300, it's a little dated now. They have FDLTs, the hunchback, who's the cast off of a Spartan, because the Spartans uh, had a practice of inspecting their babies after they were born and if they had deformities they would throw them into a heap with all the other dead babies and they would also leave them on the hillside for the night if it wasn't like winter time um and uh if they didn't survive the night um they weren't strong enough to be a spartan um so at any rate uh lots of infanticide um nonetheless uh, FELTs was a cast off but his parents, the, the crimson of, a, of a, the Spartan, they called him, uh, his parents fled the city because they didn't want to kill their baby. So um, he was a hunch because he was a hunchback. And though he could raise his, uh, so though he could shove, he could do his spear just right, you know, he couldn't raise his shield high enough to be part of the phalanx, therefore excluding him from the ability to be part of the Spartan warrior society that they had. So he could never fit in. And much like in our society today, it's very difficult to have a job, to work, um, and to um, you know get around if you are severely deformed or a person with a disability. America is the shining star in the in the world when it comes to disability. The ADA or American Disabilities Act is great and does a lot of wonderful things. You can't discriminate against people with disabilities. We have ramps everywhere that are public areas, or we should, uh, otherwise they're not to code. And you got the great parking, right? Um, and all that stuff. But still, people find ways to discriminate without saying so. It's like, oh, the other person was just more qualified. The same thing goes for when you can't discriminate against people for color, creed, ethnicity, sexuality. They, they'll find some reason, sex, you know, um, they'll find some reason why they'll pick somebody else instead and say that they were equal, but this person, this, they weren't quite equal. This person was just better in some way, although we found out that systemically that's just not the case. Um, nonetheless, uh, these great deformities make it hard for you to find a mate as well, and Aristotle believes that you should have children if you're going to be fully happy. I'm not sure that that's necessarily the case, but he claims that that's the case. Um, and again, when we talk about deformities, one of the things that's very weird, although it is kind of all over the place, if you're just dis disabled in this country, one of the things that they standardly make it be the case is that you're not allowed to work or you're only allowed to work some. Um, and uh, we look down on people who don't work. They're sucking off the government teeth. They're a leech on society or something like that. 
And this is just not the case necessarily. Most people want to work. I have a friend um, who got blown up in a tank in Iraq and was on full medical benefits and he got his MA degree with his GI Bill and he wanted to teach history in high school and he couldn't because he was full dis fully disabled. So he went there and volunteered as a you know, like a substitute or whatever, or do whatever he wanted. They treated him terribly, he hated the job, so he quit. And, you know, uh, now he's a stay-at-home dad, but he was thinking for a while about getting off or rescinding or giving back his, um, you know, uh, full disability status. And I was like, dude, do not do that. You are really young still. You don't, you, you get this for life. And if you give it back now, you never get it back. So don't do that, seriously. Um, but at any rate, um, so, you know, he did a lot of additional, um, stuff with, uh, I think scouts and, uh, explorers and stuff like that to like, you know, spend his time His he was a, a caber or a spelunker or whatever you want to call him. And his wife literally found him under a rock because she was a geologist looking for rocks while he was out doing that sort of stuff. But anyway, the point that I'm saying is people with, uh, great deformities in our society have a lot better options than they used to have. Um, and our society is still not very good at it. Um, Europe, for instance, there are just buildings you can't get into if you're disabled. It's just, there's not elevators or access ramps to do that. And it's just not, it's not even possible in some cases, but, um, we're very good about this, but we're still not the best. And we still treat people differently about that. Um, we, we just do naturally. I mean, I, I ride the bus to campus at USF a lot and well, I used to, I don't anymore, COVID plague and all that, but, um, you know, I watch the reaction on people's faces when the bus pulls over and lets on somebody with a wheelchair. And everybody just kind of groans or rolls their eyes or stuff like that. And I'm just like, oh my God, why are you so awful that, you know, what, you're going to be late for class because you were like, you know, uh, inconvenienced for a few minutes here. You should have been coming to class earlier, first off. But secondly, I mean, come on now. Um, but at any rate, people who are greatly deformed, we still do. Still, uh, still do. We still do discriminate against. And again, these great calamities can do this. So Aristotle is saying, you are in charge of virtue. That's up to you. And great calamities, your external goods can be taken away at any time. The government can come take anything they want from you. A man with a stick can come take anything he wants from you or a gun or whatever. I mean, like your external goods are not really up to you in a certain sense. Um, great calamities can fall you because of fate or fortune. And the same goes for deformity. Remember, the only minority group that you can always still join is uh, the disabled. Red Rover, Red Rover, come on over. You're only one car accident away. Um, and I'm just saying this is, I'm not saying this to be, uh, you know, smug or snide or anything like that. But I am saying, you know, you should consider... Uh, how we treat the disabled uh, very seriously. And it, I think very much this is part of ethics and our society, the way that we treat people with deformities makes it, makes, gives us the level of what great means for great deformities, because it doesn't mean the same thing as it used to mean back in Aristotle's day, because in Aristotle's day, it could be, it would mean a lot less to be considered greatly deformed than it would mean now, given our current medical technologies and such. Okay, so once again, Happiness, or the good life, the telos of mankind, the great soul man, is an activity, something that's constantly worked on, of the soul, that thing that motivates you to action, either through spirit or appetites or your reason, logos, right? You're going to give yourself reasons to do things. You're going to have a conversation or discourse in your head to do stuff. You're going to use reasons for why you motivate yourself to get up out of bed instead of having your appetite for sleep or not talk to somebody at the bar who's not your significant other or not punch a person in the face who's you know um insulting you or your significant other etc um right uh, or stop you from eating the sugar that you shouldn't have because it's bad for you or you have diabetes and it's deadly for you or something like that right these sorts of things um you have those three things that in your soul that motivate you to activity and those should be in accord with virtue which we'll talk about just in a bit completed over a lifetime because it's not just one or two things that make you good or bad or virtuous for aristotle and his ethics uh with at least minimal external goods again having more is way better he he's talking to the rich elite male athenians who are teenagers basically here and more is better he, as my father always said you can do more with money than you can without it. So 
at least minimal external gifting. Not saying you should be a minimalist in any way. Aristotle really doesn't believe that. He thinks you should have as much money as possible. In fact, he looks down on people that have to make money because he says it's best to just start off rich, um, you know, uh, so you can just get on with doing whatever it is that you actually want to do with your life rather than have to make money. But given that you're at HCC, it's likely that you have to make money, much like myself, and as a result, money making is something very, that's very important to you. But if you had all the money in the world, it, it wouldn't matter when it comes to happiness. We still need virtue, okay? And we still need those minimal external goods. And we still need not to have any great calamities befall us, which can happen even if you have a lot of money. And no great deformities, which can also still happen even if you have a lot of money, all right? So fortune can, fate and fortune can ruin your happiness but only you, uh, you can make yourself happy because none of these things, right? None of these things are going to make you happy by themselves. You can have all the external goods. You can have no great calamities. You can have no great deformities. You can have even, well, you can't have one complete friend without being virtuous because you have to be good. So that's required of that. You can have a bunch of friends of utility and pleasure, but not a, a, a complete one. Um, but, those are necessary, not sufficient conditions to achieve happiness for Aristotle. And virtue is the one thing that you really have good control over. Your friendships too, and some of the external good stuff, you know, whether you're savvy with your money or not. And uh, the calamities and deformities are pretty much out of your hands most of the time, although some of those can happen because of your own actions. But uh, again, as I may have mentioned in my last video, the ancient Greeks all the way up until at least the Epicureans don't have any sense of free will. And at the time of the Stoics and the Epicureans, we get some semblance of sort of talking about free will, but we don't have a robust concept for free will, um, like me freely willing to do this action or any action at all until uh, the early Christians, okay? So, or the Middle Ages. Um, <clears throat> so at any rate, uh, now let's talk about virtue. <clears throat> All right, virtue or arete, um, or excellence is another way of putting it, but um, virtue is a state, not an activity, it's not, an individual thing. It's a state because it's something that you habituate over time. You get in the, 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 the function of doing so over and over again. These are repetitious activities that you consistently do to call it a virtue, properly speaking, or a vice, properly speaking. They're about habits. In fact, he says that he says this very specifically in the very beginning of the second book of the Nicomachean Ethics, that Athica or ethics comes from two earlier Greek words, the etymology of these words being ethos and ethos. Ethos means habits, what you do repetitiously over and over again, create or build your ethos or your character. And when we're talking about rhetoric, that means credibility, right? But credibility and character are basically very similar words. Again, Greek is very polysemic, so it can have many meanings for words. Um, and the deal is, is that, uh, it is a state, not just one activity. It is your character that tells you what kind of ethical agent or actor you are. So over time, these things build up. How does one get good at an instrument? How does one, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, right? practice and more practice. And if you've ever been to a carnival and you've seen the carnies throwing the ball up the thing or doing the stuff and they can do it every time, it's not because it's impossible or rigged. It's because they've done it a lot. If that's what you do all day, every day, it's really easy to do a lot of stuff like that. But, you know, you can't necessarily do it unless you've repeated the activity over and over again. I asked the guy one time with the ramp to throw the ball up there so you can win the PS4 or the Xbox or whatever. I was like, okay, let's be honest. How many times did it take you before you made it your first time? And he said, oh, I'm probably about 30. And I was like, that's what I thought. So you're, you're spending five bucks 30 times at least you know, before most people are going to give up long before that. And then let's think that was the first time he made it, not him being able to consistently do it, which requires even more time. I mean, you can watch him do it. He's doing it just the same as you. You just don't know how to roll the ball up right or whatever. And these repetitions make you a good person. So what makes one a construction worker doing construction work? 
what makes one a postal worker? Get, delivering the mail. What makes one a student? Watching these videos, reading your assignments, completing your assignments, showing up for class, if that's still going on anywhere or something like that. If you fail to show up for work, if you fail to um, complete your assignments or show up for this class or sign in or whatever, if you fail to read, you are not really being a student. Now, if you're overworking yourself, you're being excessive, that can be problematic too, but we'll get there. First, it's a state. And the reason why it's also important that it's a state is because once you've been habituated into this action, you don't have to think about it very much. It's a state that decides, it decides for you. When you're courageous, you just do the thing that's courageous. You don't have much time to make those decisions. It's split second decisions that make huge differences, whether you try to push the person out of the way from the bullet or the train or you know, um, if save the child in the drowning river, you know, sorry, save the drowning child in the river, um, that you don't have time to really debate about your state of character, whether or not you're courageous or not, will decide for you. If somebody leans in for a kiss and you have a significant other, how long do you have to make that decision about whether or not you're going to, ah, or just go with it and be a cheater? The answer is not very long. You have to have a habituated state that has made that decision for you in a certain sense through your repetitious activities in the past. Uh, it's a state that decides for you, so you don't even have to think very much with most of your activities that are virtuous. Consisting in a mean. Uh, mean here is like what we mean, <laughs> pun intended, um, in mathematics. It's an average, right? It's the middle ground. Also sometimes referred to in Aristotelian philosophy as the golden mean. Uh, relative to you, and we don't mean it's relativistic in the sense that, well, my good is this, or my courage is that, and yours is that. No, 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 no. There is a universal good, um, a, a universal virtue for courage. There's a universal virtue for temperance, generosity, wit, anger, etc. And that is exact and there is no wiggle room on that. You can have an entire society of cowards, um, and that doesn't mean that anyone in that society practices that virtue. In fact, in the book, he says that the Celts are, to a man, not able to achieve courage because they are all excessively courageous and rash because they have no fear of death. So an entire society, ethnocentrically, is excluded from one of these virtues as a result of their society not knowing the right universal. The relative to you part is this. So let's say there's a child drowning in a river that's fast moving and you're on a bridge. Should you dive into the water to save the drowning child? Now, the answer to that question is relative to you. Do you know how to swim? If you don't, you're just gonna drown too and that's a waste and it's being rash, okay? If you do, well, you still might wanna know if there's rocks down there, so the knowledge of your understanding of the river is uh, another sort of thing that you should consider. Are you a strong swimmer? Could you make it make the dive in there or not? Do you know how deep the river is? Should you run down to the side? Are you a lifeguard? Do you know reach, row, throw, go is the proper order of operations for trying to save a drowning person? Not to mention, they always try to drown you too. It's real difficult to try and save a drowning person. So the courage there is, uh, in a certain sense, um, relative to you based on your abilities and your knowledge because it would be stupid or rash to do certain things and cowardly to just be like, my name is Paul and this is between y'all and walk away or not yell for help or call for help or at least try to throw them a rope or a stick or something. I don't know, I'm just saying, it's not always the same given the situation. Virtue ethics are situation-based and they don't have any cut and dry answers. Uh, the philosopher Immanuel Kant says that there are cut and dry answers and the cut and dry answer would be always try to save the child regardless if you're gonna die or not. Don't care about the consequences, just do the right thing no matter what. Aristotle says it's not the right thing if the consequences are terrible. You've done the wrong thing. Don't do that. Do the right thing, and the right thing is to find the mean that is relative to you based on your abilities and knowledge, but also based on your natural inclination. He says that people are naturally more cowardly or more over here. So if you know yourself, and this is again knowledge of oneself, which is very important, know thyself. Um, Nasthai, uh, so it's Satan, it's carved above the Oracle of Delphi's uh, temple. Know thyself and nothing in excess. Those are the two great pillars of ancient Greek um, knowledge. Um, so like, you know, the golden mean, uh, you know, all things in moderation, and know thyself, right? Um, and knowing thyself helps you know if you're a coward, then how should you act to be courageous? well, you should probably act rash, and then you'll hit the middle ground of courage. 
right? So carrying on, you want to have the mean, the middle ground, relative to you and your direct abilities and how well you've been doing at you know virtue. And it's between two vices, one of excess, one of deficiency. So for instance, the quintessential virtue of courage that they always use, uh, its deficient vice is cowardice, to be cowardly. And its excessive vice is to be rash, foolhardy, stupid, or brash. Um, it, there's not even a proper good Greek word for it, and Aristotle kind of fuddles around with it. But we have better words in English for this. This is one of the few cases that that's the case. And then we have temperance. And we don't mean temperance like the sense of, this, this is another virtue. Uh, temperance in the sense of uh, the early 20th century temperance movement where they banned alcohol. No, temperance in the ancient Greek words means um, to moderately or properly enjoy pleasures of certain bodily pleasures. So we should be temperate when it comes to pleasures, not insensible. Uh, oh, sorry, um, that got worked off a little bit. Which he says most people are not insensible. There's very few people, even animals, that are insensible, which is not enjoying pleasure enough. Um, I can only think of one character in media or literature or anything like that that really, I think, um, is an insensible character. And that's like Sheldon Cooper from The Big Bang Theory, if you've ever seen that show. Um, he is an insensible person. He does not find pleasure in the most of the things that everybody else does. And that makes him kind of a horrible person, which is why the show, in a certain sense, is there to try and make him be less insensible and come to enjoying pleasures a little bit more like a human being, right? Um, in fact, in the last couple of seasons, uh, before they finished the show, he had sex for the first time, and he said, well, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. I mean, who says that? Um, at any rate, so he says, Aristotle says, naturally, most of us are more on the excessive end of this particular virtue, intemperate. We like pleasure too much. We like to drink too much. We like to eat too much. We like to have sex too much. We like to, you know, do pleasant things too much most of the time. And that has bad effects. Uh, too many kids, STDs, uh, getting in trouble with significant others, uh, other people's wives, et cetera, husbands. In this era, it's more wives than husbands, but again, because women are mostly considered property here. Sorry, ladies, it's just the way that it is at this point in time. Um, but at any rate, uh, like adultery, for instance, is considered having sex with somebody else's wife, not having sex with outside of marriage, as it is for the Christian community, generally speaking, um, but with someone else's wife, because that's almost tantamount to theft or, you know, stealing. And Aristotle, while he has this whole long list of virtues, more than the ones that you even have listed here, um, he says that there's only three forbidden actions and three forbidden emotions or feelings. And the three forbidden actions are theft, adultery, in the way that I just said, and murder. And murder doesn't mean killing. You can get into a fight with somebody on the street and kill them, and that's still fine because that was self-defense or whatever. Murder is the secret wrongful killing or unjust killing of another. Usually most murders happen in secret and people try to get away with it. It is unusual for people to do it in broad daylight or in public or on, you know, like the middle of the street or something like that with plenty of witnesses. That's this is this uncommon um, for murderers in general. Um, and he, he says there's no middle ground for theft. There's no middle ground for adultery. Uh, there's no middle ground for murder. Um, you can't find a mean for those things. And then he says also uh, envy, uh, which you probably are confusing uh, with jealousy most of the time, because jealousy is when you... Uh, are wanting something else that you are in competition with someone else for. You're jealous when someone is hitting on your boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever because you feel like you're in competition. You're jealous when someone gets a promotion at a job over you because you're in competition with them for that same job. You're jealous um, you know, when your neighbor's hedges grow better than your hedges because you're in competition with them somehow. But most of the time you're just envious of what other people have so when people say, you just jelly, what they really mean is you're actually just envious. You want what I have, but you're not necessarily in direct competition with them at all. So envy, he says, isn't useful. Jealousy might be useful. If you're in competition with people, the Greeks thought that agonistic competition was very fruitful and useful. Envy, on the other hand, he says, just wanting stuff that's not yours is not helpful or useful. Um, spite. Okay, what does spite mean? Think about it before you Google it. Okay. Now that you thought you knew what spite was, and now that you're thinking about it, and you can't quite put your finger on it, spite is taking joy in the pleasure or joy or pleasure in others' discomfort, pain, or, or problems that's unjustified. So, for instance, it's not like when you see a car 
cut in front of you moving really fast and then they get pulled over later and you're like excited and happy because they got caught by the police and now you think that that's just and they deserve it. Um, no, uh, spite is when you're happy or get pleasure from something that they don't deserve. And it's sort of like if one of your friends, if something really horrible happens to one of your friends and you laugh at it or find pleasure in that, that's not good. In the German, they actually have a proper word for this called Schadenfreunde, which means taking pleasure in one's friend's discomfort. Uh, or like if you see somebody fall into a manhole that you don't know when they're walking and talking to them. Uh, or, you know, just not thinking about it. I mean, again, it's, it's undeserved, um, you know, pain or suffering that someone else goes through uh, that you take pleasure in. He says that's not a good thing. And then the last um, uh, feeling that you're not allowed to have is shamelessness, because shame is what keeps us all in line, according to Aristotle. That's what keeps us virtuous. Uh, without shame, we cannot have our proper virtues because that is where um, viciousness in its uh, essence sort of spawns from is not being able to be ashamed of oneself or something, uh, you know, generally speaking, vicious or bad or wrong actions. Okay, now, um, generosity. Also, we usually consider a virtue. In the uh, Project Gutenberg, Gutenberg Project translation is really old. They call it liberality. In the Greek, it's actually much closer to the word liberal as in free, um, because liberality or generosity means to freely give one's money or give one's stuff uh, to others. And as a result, the question is, how should one be generous? Because we can be wasteful if we're being excessively generous, and we can also be ungenerous, right? We can not give when we should. Um, so for Aristotle, he says, uh, well, what do you think? Is it better to give to friends or to strangers? Think about it. Oh, I do miss having the classroom. Aristotle claims it's better to give to friends. So why is it better to give to friends and strangers? Because you might be thinking, oh, that seems so self-motivated. Okay, one, is it better to act with knowledge or without knowledge? Aristotle says it is always better to act with knowledge than to act without knowledge. When you give money to strangers, literally, because they are strangers, they are strange to you, they are other, you don't know them, you don't know what they're going to do with the money. Oh, I just need a little money for bus fare, I just need some money to pay for my place to stay for the night, I just need a little money to get some gas, to get the da-da-da, get a you know train ticket, or feed my kids, or it doesn't really matter, you don't know what they're going to do with that money. Probably go spend it on booze, or drugs, or something like that, or they might actually be using it for the thing that they're saying, but since you don't know them, you can't know that. Whereas when it's your friend, you usually know what they're going to spend the money on. Either the stuff I was just talking about there, or they're going to tell you the truth and actually tell you what they're going to spend the money on. But because of your friend and you have knowledge of them, you have a better understanding of who you're giving money to and whether or not you're being wasteful or whether you're actually being generous. I have a standard rule about this when it comes to giving money to people who are panhandling, and that's if they have kids with them directly, I will give them some money because even if they're mistreating the kids, they've got to at least feed them enough keep them alive so that they can continue to panhandle with them. And then two, I give money to people who directly ask for money for drugs or booze because yeah, they're being honest, so I reward that. Uh, the last two times that that happened to me were actually quite funny, and I'll share those with you just because. Uh, the first time was in Key West and some punk rocking kids asked me for a little bit of money to get some rum. And I was like, ah, well, you got me. So I gave him a fiber. And then uh, I was uh, going to Taco Bus on Fletcher, which is next to a liquor store. And I wanted, it was Sunday, so they don't open until uh, 11, both of those places. And I wanted to get some Modelo beer to go with my burritos that I was getting for me and my fiance. And I ordered my food right at 11 when the uh, Taco Bus opened up. And then I walked over to the liquor store, which had not quite opened up yet. And there was a line of people waiting outside. Um, and if there are people waiting outside the liquor store for it to open on a Sunday, that's usually a certain type of person. And this old black woman asked me if I could spare her 37 cents. And I was like, wow, that's a really specific amount. And she's like, I just need that much. And I was like, all right, here's a $5 bill. No, don't go wasting this on food or anything. Make sure you spend this on booze. And she just laughed and laughed. But at any rate, I'm just saying, I had knowledge of what she was about to go spend her money on. In fact, she was ahead of me in line. She got a pint of vodka that was cheap as hell. Um, you know, but my point being is that acting with knowledge is better. Plus, if you give money to your friends, your friends should be virtuous, right? 
okay? Like we said earlier. And therefore, they can use that to help you be virtuous and help themselves be virtuous, right? And thus make them da -da -da -da, happy, which is the goal of all of humankind, is to be happy. So by giving money to proper folks, um, that's going to make you happier, or it should. Um, now, also giving to charity is an important thing to do as well, but you need to look in your charities. There are so many nonprofit organizations and so many charities that are scams, horrible scams. A couple of years ago here in Tampa, they had an autism um, race for the cure awareness organization that had raised millions of dollars and they'd spent less than $100,000 on actual autism stuff. And the rest of it went to galas and balls and paying for the people in the organization because nonprofit just means that you zero out your books at the end of the year and you don't um, have stocks or, 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 or carry over money. So you can just like, you know, dump it out at the end on top of the people as bonuses if you so choose to do that sort of thing. So look into it. You know what you've got in your pocket probably? A phone. And that phone could probably look up that organization to determine whether or not that they're for real or they're a sham. So use knowledge that was what it was to act with knowledge to give to organizations that would give to strangers and in fact even giving like canned foods or um you know other random donations of time isn't nearly as helpful as just giving good don good money uh to good organizations i mean i had a friend who went to cambodia to do habitat for humanity and she said that they were happy to have them there but the day that she decided she was done with it and she just bailed was the day that they built a whole bunch of stuff. And these are people when they do Habitat for Humanity, which I worked for when I was younger too, and I did a lot of stuff with that. But I at least had some training because my father did some handyman work when I was younger. And as a result, um, I'm actually pretty skilled with, you know, a hammer and nails and some power tools and things like that. So I, you know, I, I had some skills that could be utilized if need be for doing, you know, handyman type stuff. But you don't have to to be involved in Habitat for Humanity. They just kind of throw novices or people who have no idea what they're doing into building stuff, which usually ends up with it being built not that great. So she said she watched uh, she They worked the whole day and built this, this structure that was pretty crappy. And then at the end of the day, as they were leaving, she witnessed the people who the indigenous folks that they were helping there, helping there, which they were in a certain sense, tear it down and then start rebuilding it with the materials that they used to do that. So basically, all they were doing was giving them materials and making themselves feel good by helping them or something like that. Again, not to say that Habitat for Humanity is such a bad organization or anything like that. I'm just saying, you know, um, giving straight money to people who can utilize it well um, is better than, you know, donating even your time if your time is not that valuable to the cause. It's, it's wasteful. You've got only so much time, so you should only spend your time doing stuff where you're actually making a difference. That goes for anything, okay? I mean, seriously, school, protesting, uh, work, uh, hobbies, um, friendships, doesn't matter. You can be very wasteful with that time um, uh, or very ungenerous with it, okay? Liberality. What are you spending your free time, your freedom on? Okay, now wit. Aristotle also thinks that being funny, in a certain sense, is a virtue. In fact, the Greek word is uh, eutropolis, which means you, again, good, well, great, yeah. And tropos, meaning turning. So it's a great turning person or a well-turning person. It's like turning about quickly, like having quick wit or something like that, saying the right thing at the right time, at the right moment, in just the right way. You know, later on, you're thinking, I wish you would have said that one thing right there when that guy had that would have been a great zinger. And you probably know some people that are really good at being on their feet and nimble with their words when somebody says something, they say something retort right back, it's perfect, you know, and that's what wit is, according to Aristotle. And he says that it's important because it leads to the good life because one, oh God, people who are deficient in wit are so boorish. A person without a sense of humor is horrible to hang out with. I mean, you don't want to be a buffoon which I tend to fall more on this end of things, obviously, if you've been watching these videos. Um, but the deal is um, you want to be right there in the middle. Um, and I think that that's important too. Uh, a sense of humor or having good wit is something that needs to be worked on. It's not just a natural gift. I mean, some people are better at it than others, but some people are also more courageous or more reckless than others to start with, right? 
Um, but uh, again, through repetition and practice, one can get better. The comedians that you like a lot, possibly, possibly stand-up ones, they practice those routines over and over again. That shit's not off the top of their heads, okay? It's, it's repetition and repetition and more repetition. It's practice. That's what virtue is about. Now, anger. This one, this one gets kind of weird. Wrath upon the seven deadly sins, huh? Yeah, mm, that sounds so good. Um, anger is considered a virtue in the ancient Greek world. Now, one should not be excessive in this and be irascible. This is a nice fancy word for getting too angry too quickly, yet not enough to make you angry. But you should also not be meek, because being meek is bad as well. Um, so when should you properly, virtuously be angry? Well, he claims at injustice. If you see somebody wantonly just beating the piss out of a kid in the street, you know, not give him a spanking, I mean like beating a child, you should try to intervene probably. I mean, really. Um, somebody who slaps you or your significant other directly in the face, probably you should do something about that and not just turn the other cheek. I mean, I suppose you can, but not all cultures believe that that's the case, especially not the Greeks. Um, and it, it isn't necessarily good. I mean, I'm going to go with the Greeks on this one and say that you should be angry about injustice. Um, like, for instance, when, uh, you know, I helped form the union at uh, HCC and at USF, and I'm currently on the bargaining committee. The reason that I'm angry about all that is because I see injustice going on with the sort of pay and treatment that I receive as an adjunct professor at this university. Now, I love this job and I want to teach you folks, um, and I want to do my own research, which I don't get to do nearly enough of because uh, I have to do a lot of teaching. Um, so I don't have nearly as much time as I'd like to. For instance, today I was thinking about writing a paper on sincerity and insincerity and authenticity in Sartre or whether or not comedy needs to be useful to also, um, you know, uh, or efficacious in order for it uh, to provide some benefit or something like that, or it doesn't matter. That's not important. Those are my research areas. But um, again, I don't have time for that because I'm being treated unjustly. So I would like to get a raise, have some health care, et cetera, these sorts of things so that I'm not making minimum wage without health care and teaching five classes, right? Okay. So uh, a semester. I mean, you might think, oh, school teachers do that, but that's not the same thing as what I'm doing here. Also, notably, I not that all school teachers don't have PhDs, because most of them don't, but some do. But still, it's not a research-oriented job, whereas my job should be, in some respects, research-oriented rather than just teaching you folks. I like about half of it. Actually, more like two-thirds teaching, one-third um, doing research, but whatever. Nonetheless, carrying on. So, anger is a virtue for the ancient Greeks. Meekness is a vice. You shouldn't be too meek. Magnificence. I bring this one up specifically because uh, there's not a good uh, English word for it, but what it means is spending large sums of money. Now, do you have large sums of money? I don't have large sums of money. So I can't be magnificent. I'm probably never going to be magnificent. And furthermore, because I haven't had lots of money to spend properly the right way at the right time and the right, with the right people and for the right reasons, I probably wouldn't be very magnificent even if I had a lot of money because I wouldn't have the practice, right? Remember, it's repetition, repetition, repetition. Uh, this is why most people who win the lottery go bankrupt, or most sports athletes also go bankrupt, is because if you didn't have the discipline to earn the money in the first place for a lifetime of having that money to start with, right, and spending it properly, you'd end up being what he calls vulgar, or spending it like a commoner or a common person. Uh, in fact, I think his example in book four is, you know, dressing up a choir all in purple, because uh, purple was a very expensive color or dye back in the ancient days. That's why the, uh, the royal color was purple, because it came from periwinkles, which are little tiny clams, and you can squeeze just a tiny little drop of, of ink out of it. It's a very strong, very potent, long-lasting um, dye. So even if you wash it a whole lot, um, it will keep its color. But purple is the deepest color that it will get. But usually periwinkle is a blue color, because they don't, they water it down some. If you have purple, that means you got money. Um, and on top of that, just as an aside here, because I always do this, um, if you think of the Greek, you know, um, Parthenon 
and all those Greek sculptures as being pristine white marble. Um, think again, they painted the shit out of those things. They painted them gold and purple. Think of the Parthenon as being gold and purple. It's like Mardi Gras colors practically, okay? And they painted the statues too. Um, we have evidence of this in Plato when he talks about, well, when we paint the when we paint statues, we don't paint the eyes purple, even though that's the most beautiful color. So one, he's just going to go ahead and flat out say purple is the most beautiful color. But two, he's going to say purple is not a natural eye color, so that's why we don't paint eyes purple, um, you know, or, or something like that, um, which we're Targaryen or something. No, that just it's not um, Game of Thrones nonsense. Um, so carrying on, he says vulgar people would do something like that. You would spend money like a commoner. Again, that's why where the term vulgar comes from. Usually it means to be uncouth or discourteous or crass or, you know, just not have proper manners. But that's what, that's how common people act. That's how people without money, the oi ploy and the herd act. So you don't want to be vulgar with your money, you know, getting those giant, fancy, expensive rims and a gold toilet and, you know, basically frivolous things. Um, uh, you know, do you need a watch that's a hundred thousand dollars? No. Or a purse that's like 50 grand? No. I mean, like, I'm not saying you can't have quality stuff, but there's a line where it stops being about quality and it just is about status and it's just kind of a little bit vulgar, okay? Um, you know, it's unnecessary. I mean, yeah, I could spend, um, like a couple hundred bucks on a leather jacket, but that's because it's a nice leather jacket, not some packed leather crap. Right? But there's a certain point where it becomes not about the quality of the material and the craftsmanship, and it becomes more about the status of the thing. I remember, like, for instance, when I first went to Emory, which is a very rich school, um, some girl was saying she got a great deal on a Prada bag because it was only five grand. And I was thinking to myself, my car isn't worth five grand. Probably all the things that I own aren't worth five grand right now. Um, so, again, you know, I would consider that a vulgar purchase because you can get a very nice leather handbag for a couple hundred bucks. I mean, really, you could get a decent handbag for like probably 10 or 20 bucks, but I'm just saying, you know, there are some upper limits on what I would say, you know, is the case. You can get a really nice suit, but I mean, do you need a thousand dollar suit? Really? Okay. Carrying on. Um, Aristotle's basically just saying that some of us are not ever going to be able to have or possess this virtue because of how we started originally. Remember, uh, these external goods are sometimes not dependent on you. And magnificence, in some respects, sometimes is not dependent on you. I mean, some people do learn to spend their money well through repetition and practice and have lots of it and have been born into money and do so well or have earned it and then do so well. But again, you know, he says, uh, again, like, you know, don't be vulgar, like spending a bunch of money uh, like you would at a wedding on a small party. Like, you know, my super six week team, uh, sorry, my super sweet 16 uh, show on MTV or whatever. Oh my God. It was like they waste so much money. Uh, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands, like tens of thousands of dollars on these stupid parties versus what he says, or you shouldn't be stingy when spending on a wedding. Uh, I'm still not married because I had saved a bunch of, I had been saving money for a, a wedding. And when I proposed initially, I'd saved up just enough money for a ring. And then I found out what weddings cost. And I was shocked and appalled. And I was like, uh, how am I supposed to raise 10 grand on my, like aside from survival right now, just to have a basic ass wedding. And, you know, that's just not gonna happen. So uh, yeah, I've been saving money for a long time. I'm still not there. Uh, and in fact, the condo that I'm currently living in, I had a discussion with my fiance about this. And I said, okay, we can use all of our savings that we have and either have a wedding or we can put a down payment on a condo. And she said, let's get a condo. We have two dogs. It's hard to find a place to rent with two dogs. Also, we now own stuff, I suppose. Uh, my taxes got a lot harder. Um, I, had to, I had to hire a person this year for the first time ever. But at any rate, just saying. Um, so carrying on, uh, another one of the things that Justice, as he says, is the ultimate virtue. We'll get back to that in just a second. Just one last virtue that you might find funny. Um, pride. Also one of the seven deadly sins for Christians. Pride, he says, is good. It is a virtue. Because we will not, we don't want to be excessive with it or boastful. But we also don't want to be too humble. Ugh, 
God, nothing bothers me more than when I run into somebody who like, is extremely skilled at something, and they say, oh, I kind of know a little bit about that, or how to do this, that, or the other. And I'm like, you, come on. Like, for instance, uh, my late advisor, one of my late advisors, uh, Dr. Charles Guion, who is an incredible, was, sorry, an incredible scholar who just recently died, um, he wrote multiple books on existentialism, phenomenology, and philosophy and psychology. And I don't do a lot with psychology. Um, but when I wanted to ask questions about psychology, because it bleeds over into my areas of, of interest, um, I would go ask him questions about stuff. And he would always say, oh, I don't really know that much about psychology. Oh, you know, my opinion's not that great. And I'm like, you wrote three books on this. What the hell? Come on. Just stop doing that. You know, or have you ever met somebody who's really attractive and they're like, oh, I'm ugly and I'm not pretty. Or somebody who's like, oh, I'm kind of good at pool. And then they run the table, you know, like stuff like that. Like, I hate when people are like that. It, it's not that that humility is not a good trait, in my opinion. You should be proud of the stuff that you're good at. It's called good self-esteem, people. You should feel pride at what you're good at or what it is that you are that is excellent that has this virtue to it, right? That is something that you're great at. Why not? Having some good self-esteem is literally physiologically healthy for you, okay? Now, I'm not saying you should be a boastful bastard if you're good at stuff. Nobody likes a braggart, right? I mean, you know, I'm in philosophy and when you run into the, the uh, famous philosophers, I say famous in scare quotes because you guys don't know who I'm even gonna talk about, but like you run into those people, you know, we're all in philosophy, generally speaking, for the most part, pretentious. And I give people a level of pretension um, equal to the level of their knowledge. If you are extremely smart, I let you be pretentious a lot more than if you are ignorant and saying that you know stuff. In fact, I try to make you look stupid and embarrass you if you act pretentious and you don't know what the hell you're talking about. I, I will make it a point to um, question you in a Socrates-like, in a Socratic-like style to make you feel dumb and probably angry with me because I really hate when people are pretentious when it's undeserved. I don't really like it in general, but I will say if you're super smart, I'll let it slide. Okay. It's not necessarily a good characteristic. It's a little vicious here, you know, but um, you know, if you're great at something, that's, that's a thing. Um, and you should know it and you should be good at it. Remember knowledge always now justice. He claims is the most important virtue of all of the virtues. And if you have justice, then all of the other virtues come along with it. Okay. In fact, he says that if you have a complete friendship, no justice is necessary. Why? Because you would naturally be just to each other if you were actually complete friends. So what does it mean to be excessively just? I mean, I feel like I know what deficiently just would be, but what does excessively just mean? Well, book five, the entire book five of the Nicomachean Ethics is about justice. And it's weird. It's really weird, even for modern scholars, because mostly it talks about ratios and proportions and middle grounds. And that's what's supposed to be happening. The judges are supposed to be creating some sort of golden mean here. And it can be monetary. He says that literally, if you punch somebody in the face, you have profited and the other person has lost. And as a result, we need to commensurate somehow. And you think that might be a weird way of thinking about it, but if you uh, commit assault and battery on somebody, right, um, you can sue them in court and there is a specific amount of money that they have in mind, lawyers will have this in mind anyways, you probably don't know it, um, of what it's gonna cost you, right? If you get caught drinking and driving, there is a specific amount of money that's probably gonna cost you for that um, thing that happened there, right? To make the situation now just and also to try and you know, make you not wanna do that again. Right? So it's probably going to cost you like 10 grand on average to between lawyers and court fees and penalties and um, probation or um, uh, uh, the other one, uh, oh God, uh, whatever, it doesn't matter. Just you paying money to the government for making sure that you're keeping your nose clean and stuff. Um, so I think it's up to the PT, God, we're just escaping me. But justice, he claims is about certain sorts of fair, justice is about fairness, okay? And he says that it's about two things. One is giving unequals 
equal shares. That's being excessively just. Or giving equals unequal shares. And what the hell does that mean? Okay, well, let's start off with the excessive one because that's the weirdest one. To give unequals equal shares is to do this. Now, this is some real shit back in the ancient Greek era because if you were of a greater status as a warrior or a nobleman or you know aristocrat or whatever, you were supposed to get more than people who are of lower status or less good at warfare or whatever. And when they win at warfare, they'd have a pile of um, you know loot or whatever, and then you know you pick out of it from what you wanted in the circle based on your status or what level you were. So you shouldn't give the same shares to the same type of, uh, to different types of people um, based on their, you know, combat prowess or their uh, status, um, whatever. But in a better, more contemporary example, let's say that you study really hard for this um, quiz that's coming up and somebody else studies um, not at all and then I just give you all A's. I give everybody A's. Doesn't matter if you spent a lot of time on it, prepared very well, did really, really well, or prepared not at all and did really poorly. Everybody gets A's. Unequals in that situation got equal shares. Unfair. I have a very strong sense of justice. Now, when it comes to your quizzes, those are pretty much auto graded. So don't worry. I don't have to even worry about the adjudication of fairness there. When it comes to your discussion board posts, that's where fairness will come in because some of your posts are adequate. Some of them are good, and some of them are not good or not correct or just full of fluff and are not appropriate to give you credit for or full credit for. Um, so moving over to giving equals, unequal shares, let's say that two people had both made solid discussion board posts, but I didn't like you know, what the other person said, or I didn't, or I really liked what one of the people said, or let's say that uh, one of the persons had said some stuff in an earlier post that I disagreed with or that I have now found the student annoying due to emails they've sent me. So even though they have an equal um, post this time around or an equal quiz or whatever, I have made it a decision that I'm going to change your grade. And even though you are of equal value uh, in your grading, I will give you unequal shares. So person I don't like, you get a C. Person that I like, you get this B or A that you deserve even though the other person also deserved that A or B. That's the, the deficient end of uh, justice. Being, um, giving, the giving of uh, unequal shares to equals or the giving of equal shares to the unequal. Those are the two types of uh, vices when it comes to justice as fairness, according to Aristotle. All right, so now we've discussed virtue, we've discussed friendship, We've discussed um, happiness, and that is what it's all about at the end of the day, happiness. And justice and fairness usually tend to make people happy. People are like, that's not fair, and then they get all upset, right? I mean, you hear children say this all the time, and there was a, nobody said life was fair. No, but the reason why you, that's a saying is because everybody wants life to be fair. That's something that makes you happy when life is fair. Even if it's bad and it's fair, I've had people fail my class multiple times where I've tried to help them out and then they'll send me a, late, a letter, email later, sorry, email later and they'll be like, no, it's just not fair. You know, I deserve the grade that I got because I didn't do any of the work. I didn't read, I didn't show up for the midterm, I didn't show up for the final, or, you know, whatever. I didn't do what I was supposed to, I deserve this. And that's them accepting their fate because of decisions that they made. So they're being fair, they're being just with themselves and knowing themselves how they are, as opposed to complaining about this, that, and the other and their circumstances or whatever. And now don't get me wrong, I have compassion, but I have zero pity, okay? Pity um, is a, an appeal to pity is a fallacy, first of all, look it up. But I don't care what your excuses are um, unless they are very, very severe. Uh, I mean, really, it's it, it, like, if you get COVID, Show me some doctor's documentation, I'll, you know, whatever, it's fine. Um, if you need a medical withdrawal in general, I'm compassionate about filling out the paperwork to make that happen. Um, but in general, just not completing all your work is not acceptable just because, okay? There's not a good reason for me to give you a passing grade 
just because you signed up for a class, okay? Uh, that, 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 it doesn't matter to me, okay? Um, at any rate, justice is something that Aristotle thinks is very important. Virtue is what leads us to happiness, and happiness is what the human telos is, which leads us to the final thing I'm going to say about this, and this is it. Um, so, what are, so the book that comes after the ethics is the politics, and it naturally leads into it. Man is a social political animal. He talks about virtue. He talks about virtue, and he talks about happiness, the human greatest good, the telos, the highest end, right? So why do we have politicians at all? I mean, because most people don't like them, right? Well, mostly because we're lazy and we don't want to do the work that they do. It's like somebody ought to do something about that. And usually when you say that statement, the answer is you. Or you elect somebody to do that for you and you, def you know, defer some of your freedom and some of your power to somebody else so that they can take care of making sure that there's, you know, sewer systems at work and water that flows and electricity that's on and, you know, that we have police that are doing their job of serving and protecting um, and that we have, you know, uh, firemen who stop fires instead of starting them or taking stuff from burning buildings like they did back at the turn of the 20th century or, you know, other things like that. I mean, like, look, we have, um, you know, politicians to ensure that these sorts of institutions exist and we have them to do what? Why are we, why do we want any of those things? What's the for the sake of which that all the for the sake of witches are for? Happiness. So what do we have politicians for? To make us happy. And when they don't make us happy, we elect new people or we get new people. Or sometimes when they're really not making us happy, we round them all up and we execute them. We hang them, we guillotine them, we give them the high speed lead injection. I mean, if you look at real revolutions, not the American War for Independence, because that wasn't a real revolution. If you were a farmer beforehand, likely you were a farmer afterwards. If you were a merchant beforehand, likely you were a merchant afterwards. Um, but if you talk about real revolutions, like the French Revolution, where they third estate, the peasant class rose up and executed all the clergy and the, uh, and the uh, aristocrats, via guillotine mostly, um, that was a real revolution, not like ours. Um, the Russian Revolution, where they executed almost all of the aristocracy, except for maybe Anastasia, but I think her too, and, you know, everybody but the bureaucrats got the axe as well. Uh, or, you know, the Soviets would purge people all the time. Uh, I know a lot about Soviet history, and it was, you know, uh, there was a lot of purging of people that they thought were not contributing to the whole, you know, in a proper way, so that we can all be happy. Okay? so. Um, so same with most other revolutions, they end with a lot of people getting executed because if our politicians aren't doing what we want them to do, occasionally we rise up, revolt, and burn shit to the ground and kill people. Um, that's just what we do because otherwise, what are the politicians there for? Us to give our tax money to for nothing? No, politicians are there to make us happy. They're supposed to make our lives better. Okay, now, since they're there to make our lives better, what should the proper goal of legislation through politicians be? And guessed it, virtue. They should be legislating virtue because virtue is what leads to happiness. And that's why politicians should be teaching you and making laws on how to be virtuous. And also, moreover, making laws on how to properly rear children because Aristotle says that your virtuous nature is basically ingrained mostly by the time you're 18 and after that you can't do too too much with it it's like a jello mold once you set it you know you can cut it into some shapes and do some stuff with it but it's pretty much set once it's set uh in whatever shape it started with that's why it's so hard once you've been enculturated or so difficult to change once you've been raised in a certain way like that line the Mueller line thing that i showed you guys the other day and for those of you who I didn't show that to, um, it's this illusion that um, these two lines, you know, again, if you didn't see my earlier video, you can gain benefit now.
Okay. Now, you just saw me draw that. Those two lines are the same length, literally. But because of what we call the Mueller wire line and the carpenter's corner, the top one should appear to you as being longer um, than the bottom one. But you saw me draw it, so you know that that's the case, right? Okay. So, oddly enough, my mother, who grew up in rural Panama, the country, on a farm which didn't have a ton of right angles, didn't really see this illusion when I showed her this video, okay? Now, I mentioned this in the earlier video that the more right angles you're around growing up, the more that you see this illusion, and the less that you saw growing up, the less that you see this illusion. Um, Aboriginal people from the San Kung uh, and the outback of, uh, from Sub-Saharan Africa and the outback uh, Aboriginals uh, from Australia don't see this illusion at all because they're not around right angles. And I mean, like I said in the earlier video, there are so many right angles in this room. Every single slat on my, on my window um, Venetian blinds is at a right angle, a 90 degree angle. Every, my, all of my, the angles on my degrees are at right angles. Every door is at a right angle. The corner of this board is at a right angle. Um, right angles, 90 degree angles are everywhere. And as a result, we see this illusion more, the more that it's around us. And that's just an enculturation that happens. Notably also, this is why the communists thought that you can't change people once they've reached a certain age. So there's no point in trying to reenculturate them they just have false consciousness at a certain point and they will always believe what they're going to believe and this is one of the reasons why they utilize that type of thinking to have great purges whether they're right or not still to be said i don't think the purges were a good thing at all but that is the reason that they said that, that they could do that they needed fresh young minds like plato claimed in the republic they needed to expel everyone who was under the age of 12 from the city or like heraclitus said give the city to the boys and get rid of, kill everyone else, you know, like, because uh, they got rid of Hermidorus, the best man among them. Uh, again, this idea that if you catch children at a young age and enculturate them properly, they will turn out better and more virtuous and in turn happier, right? So our politicians should be legislating virtue and instilling laws with virtue to be utilized on children but we live in America. I do what I want. You can't tell me how to raise my kids. I do what I want. I'll, they need skinny and butter, and I'll feed them sugar straight out of the bag if I feel like it. Don't you tell me my kid's stupid or wrong. I'll tell you what's up. No, 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 no. You have to have the right upbringing from the very beginning or else it's impossible. Well, not impossible. Aristotle says it isn't always, it is never really a lost cause because of the habituation and repetition of these virtues. You can get better, but it takes a lot more. He says, if you haven't been acclimated to feel pleasure at doing virtuous things from a very young age and pain at doing vicious actions from a very young age, that you will not feel that properly growing up. And then you won't feel that properly as an adult. He says that the continent man is the man who does the right thing because he knows it to be the right thing, but does not feel pleasure out of it, or at least doesn't feel pain or regret from it. Most of us are merely continent. The people who feel good about doing good things when they do them, those are the virtuous people. Um, and he says that it's about raising you to feel that way. My father as a child used to make me play chess. Um, and, uh, you know, I was bad at it. And he beat me every time and it wasn't valuable until I learned you know, how to actually beat him. I think it was from the time I was in first grade till I was in like third grade, I couldn't beat him once. Also, he used to bribe me to read books, okay? And he'd give me like candy or action figures or whatever to read books and at first, or a remote control car. And at first, I read the apology, I think, for, for a remote control car the first time when I was in third grade um, uh, by Plato. Uh, so at first, I did these things solely for the treat the external good. But then after a while, I just started to enjoy reading and philosophy and things like that. And then it wasn't about getting treats or goods anymore that were external to myself. Then it was just about internal goods and feeling good inside because I had been bribed into feeling accustomed to a good feeling of being associated with doing the right thing, reading a book or doing the right action, as opposed to feeling bad and shameful about doing the wrong action or something that I should feel bad or shameful about. So if you're not enculturated that way to start with, you're not probably gonna be able to be virtuous. Now, this looks like a pretty fucking tall order if you wanna be happy, right? <laughs> you might be saying, well, how are you ever gonna get all of that? And the answer Aristotle has is simple. Not everybody's gonna be happy. 
It's a high bar. This is the telos. This is the best you can do as a human being. This is human excellence. There is nothing better and not everybody's gonna get it. In fact, most people aren't. If you're lucky, you'll be continent. Just, you know, you, you, you're good. You're not necessarily gonna get happy, okay? This is something to shoot for. If you've ever seen that movie, The Incredibles, right? If everybody's super, then nobody is. This isn't some sort of code where if you just follow the code, then you're in like Flynn and you're good. This isn't some sort of deal where it's just like, if I say that I'm saved and I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I'm going to heaven. That seems pretty easy. What about all that final judgment stuff? Or, you know, all the things that you did that were shitty over your life or all the things that you did that were good. None of that matters. That's why I don't generally specifically like that sort of particular version of Christianity where it's not about good works because you know, as being raised Catholic, they um, instill in you that good works are very important. Most of the other Christian stripes say that good works will not get you into heaven. I don't like when they take that part out though because then it's like you can be a jerk and a horrible human and you can still get into heaven and people feel fine with that then as long as they're trying to convert people and going to church and stuff. I don't care what you believe in, but doing good stuff for other people seems like a good thing. So if religion is what brings that you to you to do that, I'm all for it. But, um, you know, just having insular beliefs as your route to happiness, I don't think is necessarily, practically speaking in the world, as good as, you know, good works, quote unquote, depending on what you want to call that, because that's also up in the air as far as what we want to call good or bad or whatever. But nonetheless, it's all about happiness. It's about having virtue. And in the good state, we will have good politicians who will be virtuous and will legislate virtue. And that is what happiness is all about. Right, folks? I wore my little happy pin today. Have a good one.